The Ingredients by Henry Kitchell Webster, first published in the Saturday Evening Post, July 1912. The model knew the tricks of the trade, so when she noticed that the painter's gaze had settled itself at the level of the flounce of her petticoat, she strained her back, raised her bare arms, and indulged in a long, slow stretch and a yawn that made her eyes water. There was no hurry. He'd be working away down there on the lower part of his canvas for some time. In the corner, behind Burton, was a big mirror, and if she had craned her neck just a little, she might, without interfering with him, have seen the deliberate, infallible brushstrokes that were the envy and the despair of so many of his colleagues. For you might quarrel with Burton's ideas, or what some people considered his lack of them, or with the palette he sometimes worked in, but there were no two words about his painting. The model didn't look. If anyone had asked her, which no one did, she might have discoursed feelingly on the folly of painting a picture of a girl washing her hands in a common white porcelain washbowl that stood on an imitation mahogany washstand with a cheap porcelain pitcher beside it and the slop jar, which completed the set, glaring without apology in the foreground. Also, she might have had a word to say of the absurdity of hanging a corner of the room, as Burton had done, in a light blue eight-cent wallpaper. And what was the sense when a girl had come up to the studio in a perfectly new brown suit that was the latest style, absolutely the latest, in painting her picture in a common white petticoat and chemise? That was what she wanted to know. At least, it was what she would have wanted to know had her thirst for any sort of knowledge been more than negligible. Instead, she started another stretch. But as Burton looked up just then, she checked it hastily and resumed the pose. Tired, he asked. It's rather hard, isn't it? Well, now, it's harder than you think, she assented. Bending over just a little like that puts a sort of crick in your back. I'd rather be all doubled up or standing on one leg or something. With a little roll of his loaded brush, Burton defined a highlight on the rim of the bowl. Then he stepped back for a look. We'll call it a day, he said. The girl wriggled her shoulders and lounged across to the steam radiator, where she leaned back, folding her arms behind her. Burton pushed the easel a little further out into the room, and in doing so turned it so the girl could see what he'd been painting. She looked at it vaguely without the slightest change of expression. Well, she said encouragingly, that slop jar certainly does look awfully natural. She yawned again, but this time, when she saw that Burton was smiling, she shaded it off into a rather apologetic little laugh. I guess I ain't much on art, she added. I'm with you there, Burton added emphatically. I'm not much on art myself. She looked round at him with a momentary flash of interest. She could believe what he said easily enough. He was not like the rest of them. His trimly cut hair was brushed in an ordinary way. His ordinary looking tweed suit wouldn't have disgraced a teller in a bank. And there was not a paint stain on him anywhere, not even on his hands. But her interest died out as he added, at least it's a question of spelling, art with a big A. He broke off and went close to the canvas contemplating the brushwork over a patch of it with a thoughtful eye. The girl was looking at a portrait that stood out at an angle from the wall as if inviting inspection. It was of a man somewhere about 60 years old, prosperous, authoritative, restrained, a formidable, predacious looking figure, characteristic of the rapidly passing heroic age of American finance. That's Kirby, isn't it? She said. Randolph Kirby? Burton nodded without looking up. I think that's fine, said the model. Why, it might almost be a photograph of him. The painter smiled. That's what Kirby said about it himself. But still, the question arises, 
I didn't ask Kirby this. Why have a portrait at all? Why not stick to photographs? I've thought of that. Evidently, the model found it rather puzzling. Oh, but there's some class to a portrait, she concluded. It shows you've got the price, suggested Burton, and the girl nodded assent. I've seen his picture in the papers, she went on. That's how I knew him. I see his daughter's got her divorce. She leaned back comfortably against the radiator and stroked her arms. I guess those foreign counts are a pretty bum lot, even the best of them. She certainly drew down a lemon all right. Burton had caught up a brush and was making an imperceptible change in the color of one of the shadows on the face. We'll finish this tomorrow, he said, cheerfully ignoring the topic that she had chosen. He fell back for another look and regarded his work with undisguised satisfaction. So you don't think much of this, eh? Oh, I suppose it's all right, said the model, only, well, I should think you'd paint something pretty. Like this, he questioned. He walked swiftly across the studio to where another easel stood. Its canvas turned toward the wall. He wheeled it round and pushed it toward the light. <coughs> he heard a little gasp of wonder from the model. Then came a silence more eloquent than words. My, breathed the model at the end of it. My, but ain't that swell. She turned on Burton with sudden vehemence. Who did it? She demanded. He answered with an ironical little bow. You, she cried. What's worse, he assented. I'm going to sign it. Well, why in the world, if you can do things like that, do you? The model let the sentence trail away as her look reverted to the picture she'd been posing for. I don't know, said Burton thoughtfully. I ask myself that question every day. I suppose it's an attempt to demonstrate that it's possible to serve both God and mammon. He plunged his hands in his pockets and began to move restlessly back and forth across the room. The girl paid no more attention to him than to the answer that he had given her, which she had not understood. She was gazing with round eyes and open mouth at the portrait. Did she really have those furs? She asked at last. Or did you just make them up? Yes, she had the furs and she had the necklace. I've painted them pretty well, haven't I? That necklace now, a jeweler could almost identify the pearls. The cutting edge of irony in his voice was lost on the girl. I should think he could, she wondered. Burton's restless pace grew quicker. He was struggling with an overmastering desire to tell the truth for once. The clear absurdity of the impulse made it all the harder to resist. After all, where could he find a safer depository than in the uncomprehending ears of the girl who stood gaping there? He stopped short and faced her. I'm going to tell you a secret, he said. The girl looked round at him, puzzled, a little uneasy. It wasn't a bit like Burton to get fresh with his models. She'd posed for him long enough to find that out. He never had much to say and his one concern at the end of a sitting seemed to always be to get rid of her as early as possible. He was looking straight at her, but with an abstracted gaze that saw nothing. That picture over there, the one you're posing for, is a piece of really honest work. But it's more than that. It's really beautiful. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I know it. And there'll always be a small class of people in the world who'll know it. Perhaps after they've said so often enough, the others may come to agree with them. Not because they see it themselves, but because they'll believe what they've been told. It may be that some millionaire of the 22nd century, if there are any millionaires then, will buy it for a quarter of a million dollars, and then people will stand in front of it in the gallery and look solemn and check it in their catalogs to convince themselves that they've really seen it. Whether that happens or not, and I'll be too dead to care before it does, no amount of silly praise, nor ignorant neglect, nor change of the fashion of the day 
can make one grain of difference to that picture. It'll always be there, and there will always be a few that know. In their hearts, the rest will always agree with you. The model had been placidly occupied stroking out the wrinkles in the petticoat about her hips, but she straightened up with a little start on the you and looked at him in vague embarrassment. She wished he'd stop talking and let her go home. Burton strode over to the other easel and dragged it out further into the light. Now just look at this thing, he commanded. Oh yes, I've used lots of pretty pink and white paint and I've painted a pretty pink and white face and the rest to match. And as you say, the furs are expensive and the pearls are real. But look at it. What is her weight resting on? Nothing. Where's her backbone? Nowhere. She hasn't any. Where's her right leg? There wasn't room for it if she was to taper down like that. Look at the size of that foot. She couldn't stand on it. See how bright her eyes are. That's because they aren't in the plane of her face, really, but way out in front of it. They ought to be strung on two strings like beads to keep them from falling. In four words, the thing is plausibly, inconsistently, and infernally rotten. He stepped back from it with a grim laugh. He had forgotten the very existence of the girl beside him. On her part, she was wondering whether she'd come back tomorrow or not. Oh, she supposed he was all right, really. Only she wished he'd shut up and let her go. Of course, in its own way, it's good, he went on. It has to be. You have to know how to draw to do a thing as bad as that and get away with it. But the further you can go without giving yourself away, the better they like it. I guess in that direction, this thing's about my limit. He turned away and strode off on his old patrol across the room. The girl edged tentatively in the direction of the stairs up to the loft where her clothes were. But he stopped her with a gesture. Why do I go on with it? He demanded. That's the question. It isn't because I need the money. Lord, I'm rolling in it from the dozens and scores of these things I've done before. Why don't I turn honest now I've grown rich? Well, I like to be the fashion. I suppose that's the answer. One answer anyway. As long as these idiots are waiting three or four ahead all the time for stuff like this, I go on turning it out. And they like it. Bless you, they eat it up. There's a sort of pleasure, I suppose, in seeing how far I can go without giving myself away. Oh, they don't deserve anything better, I know. I tried it once with one of the best of them. He broke off with a little, with a little laugh, and, oddly enough, his gaze swung round to the picture of Kirby that stood out on the floor at an angle from the wall. Her father was a real man, and I had an idea that she was a real girl, that there was something inside her clothes and behind her face. The girl was looking at him now with an expression of genuine interest, and her look stopped Burton as suddenly as a dash of cold water in his face. She scented a romance. All right, he said shortly. I'm through for the day. Run along and dress. Five minutes later, he was able to watch her go, with a smile of pure amusement at his own expense. He was enough of a philosopher for that. He realized quite well that everybody, once in a while, had to turn loose and make a blithering fool of himself. He could hardly have chosen a better witness for this outbreak than the model. She would account for the whole thing with the comfortable adjective nutty and let it go at that. And, after all, she would probably be nearer right than any of his friends. Suppose, just suppose, the outbreak had come a little later, before the visitor he was expecting, before the visitor he was expecting now, any minute. Burton straightened up with a grin, turned his picture of the girl at the washstand to the wall, and was in the act of turning the portrait of the girl with the necklace when he checked his hand and left the thing where it was. What's more, he lied to himself about his reason for doing it. He said the reason was that it would save explanations, avoid false pretenses, and so on. The real reason was that he hoped that when the girl who used to be Ethel Kirby looked at the portrait of this other young girl with the necklace, she would ask a question and give him the chance to answer it. Then, to show himself how little the visit meant to him, he began 
setting his palette to rights and cleaning up his brushes. Because, of course, it was altogether likely that she would not come. It was not until he heard ring at the bell that he wondered how he should address her. Countess? That would seem like rubbing it in. Oh, well, it wasn't really necessary to call people anything if one used a little management. Perhaps that was what made his greeting rather warmer than he had meant it to be. Oh, how do you do, he cried when his opening door revealed her. I was afraid you wouldn't come after all. I'm not interrupting then by being too early. It was hard even for his trained eyes to see just where she had changed. She was little, if any, thinner. Certainly there were no wrinkles. Even the bloom on her skin was still there. There was a little more definition to her features, perhaps, more of what he was in the habit of calling edge. But it was not so much the features themselves, after all, as the expressions that played across them. Her smile, ah, that was different. It had come almost instantly with her recognition of him, certainly before his word of greeting was half spoken. Her old smile used to break through so slowly, unevenly, as if against a shy, reluctant resistance. All that went through his head in just the second it took to shut the door after her. Oh, you're safely after hours, he assured her. Let me take your coat. It had to be warm here for the model. Yes, she's gone home. Dad said he thought you wouldn't mind if I ran in for a look. He's awfully proud of it. But I really think he keeps you painting portraits of him just for the fun of watching you work. He says he's never met more than a half dozen men who really knew their business, and you're one of them. Burton was a pretty good stage manager. She did not see the portrait until he had released her from her coat. Then, as she turned, her eye fell on it. There he is, said Burton. She nodded and did not speak immediately. Yes, there he is, she assented. It would have been an exaggeration to say she did it raggedly or even unevenly. But some of the hard, smooth suavity was gone out of her voice. Some of his business friends, said Burton, like it rather less than the first one I did of him, the one they've got at the bank. She assented with a curt nod that reminded him a little of her father. They would. And she took her time about explaining. There's rather more of him in it than they see. She turned and looked at him thoughtfully. I wonder a little that you saw it. I had an idea that no one ever saw. Just that man, except me. Burton walked up close to the canvas and began studying a corner of it as if he suspected something wrong in the varnishing. He talked about you pretty constantly while I was painting it, he said quietly, and he didn't look round at her. He did not need to. The tension of the little silence that followed his words had as much meaning as any look there could have been in her face. A moment later, he heard her turn away. Oh, Sylvia Herbert, she exclaimed, and that released him from his affected occupation. She told me you were doing her. He watched her face intently while she gazed in silence for a minute or two at the portrait of the girl with the necklace. Her expressions were well schooled now, and at first there was nothing to see except a polite simulation of interest. Then, irrepressibly, a cynical little smile flashed across it. And in that same instant, she knew he was watching her. She turned on him quickly and met his own smile of complete understanding. Yes, she said, that's the way I wanted you to paint me. And how disappointed and angry I was when I found you weren't doing it. Her eyes went back to the portrait. I can see now how silly it is. I didn't know then, four years ago. I suppose you must always have known. I don't suppose a man could do that unless he knew better. And then came what was to him the first real reminder of old times that her presence had brought, the little gasp of consternation following the utterance of a remark that had not sounded as she meant it to. 
You're quite right about that, he said. I said the same thing not ten minutes ago. Then why? But she broke off for a fresh start. You knew this was just the sort of thing I wanted, just exactly what you were doing for everybody else. And you hadn't ref... I mean, you meant to go on doing it for other people. You've been doing it ever since, haven't you? Then why wouldn't you do it for me? That was the question he had hoped she would ask. He would not have denied now that this was the reason why he had left Sylvia Herbert's portrait out to stare at them. But he was not ready with his answer. Queerly enough, it was not because she had changed so much from the girl he had known pretty well four years ago, but because she had changed so little. With an uncanny little flash of insight, she guessed what was making him hesitate. Oh, you can talk frankly enough about Ethel Kirby. I'm someone else altogether. I wonder whether I can't answer you best by showing you what I was trying to do then. I've got the thing her here, just as it was that morning, four years ago, when you... She was smiling reminiscently. What a rage I was in! Yes, I'd like to see it very much, if you can find it without too much trouble. I can find it, he said. But for a moment he just stood there looking at her. And at last, the mask melted. That's what I came up for, really, for a look at Ethel Kirby. I wanted to make sure there was such a person once. For a canvas that had been left unfinished four years ago by as busy a man as Burton, it was surprisingly easy to find. But when he came back from his alcove only a moment later, lugging the big unframed stretcher, she was the woman he had opened his door to, self-possessed, secure in her defenses. And she was looking in serene amusement at the still life for the picture he had been painting that day. The corner he had hung so carefully in eight-cent paper, the imitation mahogany washstand, and the dour ninety-eight-cent set that adorned it. That isn't furniture, he explained. It's props for a picture. A picture? Out of that? she laughed. I suppose that's your way of getting even with Sylvia. He leaned the unfinished portrait, still face in, against the wall. It was not quite time for that. Then he turned round the canvas of the model washing her hands, and he took care not to disturb the long, silent scrutiny she bestowed on it, even by so much as a glance at her. Somehow it makes you feel good, she admitted at last. It's so true and fresh-looking. The light's so clear and cool, like early morning. You feel as if you'd like to splash around in that water yourself. It reflects so beautifully from the girl's arms. And how you've made that awful wallpaper sing. But, but why? She turned on him now, and her voice was full of protest. Why couldn't it be beautiful as well as true? That, that happens to be an important question to me right now. It is beautiful, he said quietly. But it's made up of such ugly ingredients. Why not a pretty model and pretty French things and the petticoat put on straight instead of all humped around like that? And why pick out that dreadful paper and that fearful washstand and that horrible? She nodded indignantly at the slop jar that shone, shone shamelessly white in the foreground. It was the most beautiful thing I could think of to put just there. It needed to be plain and white and just about that size, or your first look at the picture wouldn't have satisfied you the way it did. A homely fact, even an ugly fact, out in plain sight in the foreground, doesn't need to spoil the picture. She looked up quickly, but if any secondary meaning underlay his words, his face gave no sign. He went on thoughtfully. Of course, the other sort of thing can be beautiful too. Laces and brocades and empire furniture. But what's the use? Everyone knows pearls are beautiful. So's a wet cake of soap. Beauty's a matter of relations, not ingredients. He pulled up with a shrug. Preaching again, 
Here endeth, here endeth the first lesson. She ignored his apology. I think I'm beginning to see. She's just an ordinary girl putting on her ordinary clothes, and when she's had her breakfast, she'll probably go down to some ordinary job in a streetcar. And yet she's doing a beautiful thing, just washing her hands. And she'll do other beautiful things in the course of an ordinary day's work, if only people with the right sort of eyes happen to look at her. And if she has the right sort of eyes herself, she can see beautiful things about her all day long. That's the moral, isn't it? Oh, I don't pretend to be a missionary, he began a little uncomfortably, but she cut him short. I know you don't. You can see the truth for yourself. Why bother about the stupid people who can't? I suppose you've painted other things like this all along. More or less. So that some day you can show us that you've only been laughing. She let that sink in with a little silence, and you could think of no way to break it. But I've an idea you meant to help me when I needed it, without knowing, four years ago. And you hadn't been too afraid of being a missionary and not being understood and having to bother, you would have helped. Well, I need help now again, and I'm going to ask for it. By now, he had no idea of trying to break the silence. Even when she began to speak again, he did not fully hear at first. Afraid of being a missionary, of being misunderstood, of having to bother, when he might have helped. You said beauty was a matter of relations, not ingredients. That's right, isn't it? Well, how far does that go? How far can I go with it? How far? Why, all the way, I should think. Certainly truth isn't a matter of facts, nor goodness a matter of doing certain things and leaving undone certain others. It's true of everything, I should say, that's an art rather than a science. You mean living itself's an art? He nodded. Praise God. That's all very well for you, but there are some of us who can't feel quite so satisfied. She gave another little gasp at that and made a quick gesture of appeal to him. Please don't mind. I shouldn't care, don't you see, if you'd just let me go the other time, if you'd painted my portrait as I wanted you to, a vain, spoiled, young, ignorant thing, reaching out for a lot of unrealities because they glittered and she wanted them. On her way to be scorched and disillusioned, oh, and very bitterly unhappy. It wasn't up to you. You weren't your brother's keeper. You needn't have cared. But you knew, and you did care. In a way, you even warned me. You painted me so real and solid, so completely the Ethel Kirby I was getting away from, the girl who used to manage to get down to breakfast with Dad about three mornings in seven, that you made me homesick. Took the shine off the Christmas tree ornaments I was reaching in among the candles for. You cared enough to do that, but when I resented it, because I didn't understand, you shrugged your shoulders and washed your hands of me. When you might have tried harder, spoken more plainly. Of course, she paused and her old slow smile came through. There was no one else who did even as much as you, but there wasn't anyone else who both knew and cared. Dear old dad, if I wanted anything, that settled it. He might have been unhappy and fearful, but he wouldn't let me know it. Do you remember how he sided with me that morning I brought him to see the portrait? Burton laughed. Remember, it might have been yesterday. But at that, the light went out of her face, and she shivered. Yesterday, she echoed. Yes, he persisted. You are Ethel Kirby still. You've hardly changed at all. Why, I could finish that portrait from you almost as you sit, if only you were dressed right. For that matter, I've still got the frock you posed in. Changed? Why, you even smiled in your own way not a minute ago. He went across to the unfinished portrait that leaned face in against the wall and laid a hand on it. Won't you look and see for yourself? No, she protested, not today. 
He had a quick way of understanding some things. He did not urge her further, but came back without a word and stood beside her while she looked meditatively at the picture of the girl with the washstand. It was like old times, this long, unembarrassed silence. At last she looked round at him. I said I needed help again, and I was going to ask you for it. I think perhaps you've helped me already, given me the clue I needed. But I want to be sure I understand. You said that even an ugly fact, out in plain sight, in the foreground, needn't spoil the picture. Did you mean that for me? She shot the question at him so squarely, her eyes held his so steadily under those sensitive, mobile brows of hers, that he stammered and flinched away. Of course, he began lamely, I didn't mean... Oh, won't you help even now, she cried. What's the use of being polite and pretending? I was a fool, and for a while, a perfectly eternal while, I stood the consequences rather than admit what a fool I'd been. And at last, when the consequences grew so unspeakably degrading that I couldn't stand them, I ran away from them and took the world into my confidence. I've no secrets anymore, even from the Hearst reporters. There's my divorce, the first thing anyone thinks of when he sees me, out in plain sight in the foreground of the picture, the receptacle for, oh, gossip and guesses and a subtle sort of commiserating ridicule. That's the way it seemed to me. I felt the picture was cheapened, spoiled. And then you seemed to tell me it wasn't. I wanted to be sure that that was what you meant. She could have cried or laughed over the way the man was taking it. Here she was turning out her soul before him, and he, oh, it was like him. How many times in the old days had he encouraged her confidences by the same sort of innocent device? He had dropped down thoughtfully on a low stool before his brushes and was wiping them methodically one by one on an oily rag. Cheapened, spoiled, he echoed. What was Ethel Kirby anyway? A little fool, of course, everyone worth being allowed to grow up as a fool when young and off and on when old. She was a promising little fool with an aptitude for discovering that fire would burn her fingers and that soap bubbles would burst and that thin ice would crack and that Christmas tree ornaments run rather low on bullion. He dropped his brush, sprang up, and before she could protest, had turned the unfinished portrait from the wall. There she is. Look at her. She's not so much. You're worth a dozen of her. You found out all she promised to learn, and a whole lot beside. You're young. Young? Yes, I know how old you are. I even remember your birthday. She smiled reluctantly at that. Young, he reiterated, and healthy and courageous. But her attention now was fastened to the portrait, and for a while she made no comment on what he had said, just looked and looked with half-shut, thoughtful eyes. But at last she smiled again and spoke. I suppose she wasn't so much. I suppose in rather a silly way I've been idealizing her. But at least she was young and healthy, and in her foolish way courageous. And I suppose that I am still a bit of a fool. Oh, yes, he said. That surprised her into looking up at him. But there was not a sign of resentment in her face. In general or in particular, she asked. He took a long breath and held it for a second before he answered. She was enough her father's daughter to be a bit formidable. I was thinking in particular, he said, about your new toy, your toy tragedy. Her eyes darkened at that, and her fine expressive brows flattened ominously. Child, he cried, there are real troubles in the world, real tragedies. There are branded people, mutilated, broken people with life on their hands, and many a one of them has made a beautiful thing of it. Yet there you stand with that tragic mask of yours, talking of being cheapened, spoiled. Why, you're intact altogether, all but your pride. That's been rather badly singed, I'll admit. But bless you, it will grow out again. The real things that matter, your energy and courage and faith, yes, your faith, 
Haven't you shown it this afternoon by coming to me? The tension of her body relaxed a little. She turned away rather suddenly and pressed her palms to her eyes. She was not the sort who liked to cry on anybody, and Burton cheerfully ignored the phenomenon of tears. You've turned missionary too, he said. That brought her wet eyes round to him wide open. Missionary? You've convicted me, he said quite seriously, on three counts of being a coward, a snob, and a charlatan. A charlatan without the courage of my convictions. She laughed rather raggedly. And I'm a fool with a toy tragedy. And then suddenly another laugh came, a laugh of pure happiness that clutched at his throat as even her tears had failed to do. Oh, it's so good to be back, she said, scolding each other and calling awful names. I expect they're all true, too, she concluded more soberly. His face was sober, too, but there was a sort of smile behind it somewhere. Shall we both reform? he asked. Is it a bargain? He was holding out his hand now, but she had hers clasped behind her, waiting for terms. If I'll put a coat of black soap all over Sylvia, will you let me finish the portrait of Ethel Kirby? She looked in rather a puzzled fashion at the girl with a necklace. Black soap? She questioned. What's that for? To make the paint come off. Give me a fresh start. The cynical little smile flashed across her face again. It seems a pity, she said. Sylvia will love that down to the ground. Are you sure you've got the frock I post in? And that's the end.